All right, let me go back. All right, so let me go back real quick to show the other class this. All right, so I need you to click on this engage link that's in this engage module. You have to click on load new window and it pulls up our engage site. So our engage site is where your lab manual is, the, 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 the ebook for your lab manual, that's gonna be important. And it's also where you're gonna do a quiz. We have one graded quiz in the exercises in Engage. So I'm gonna show you what that, what that is in a second, but ultimately everybody has the first two exercises for free. So even if you, did, you didn't buy a code yet, or you, didn't, you don't have a book that you bought from the bookstore that has a code in it, you can still work on, the, on these first two exercises. So this week is when we're doing exercise one. So to purchase your code, because on the third week, if you don't have a code registered or purchased as of yet, you won't be able to do your work in exercise three. This is what we're doing on the third week, the third class from now. So you, you can start working on these without the code, but to purchase the code, you just click this here button and then just follow the instructions online to purchase the code. I think it's like $35 or something. If you buy the book in the bookstore, I think it's like 60 something dollars. I don't remember, but it's a little cheaper to do it through here. So for instance, you buy, you buy your code here. And if you go to your, uh, your exercise that you're working in, all of the exercise modules look the same. Your chapter, your exercise chapter in the lab manual is up here at the top. It'll always say printable PDF. Um, and this is exercise one chapter. So I can click that link and it'll pull it up in the middle. And this is, you know, the same chapter that's in the paper book that you would buy. So if you have a printer at home, you can right click in here and say print and you can print your chapter out, you know? So this is a little bit a cheaper way to do it. Or you could, you could just read your lab manual online if, if, if that's what you like doing. I kind of like having a paper copy, so I, I used to print mine out. All right, so. Is this the only material we need, like this ebook? No, or we... no I'm gonna show you where everything's at. This is part of it. Okay. Okay. This, is, this is the lab manual that we're, we work out of specifically, but I also have some other resources that I'm gonna have you guys working out of. So I'm gonna show you those in just one, one minute. Um, so that's the ebook. Now to get back, to the other page where your assignment is. Just hit this button over here again. You know, exercise one, I click it. It brings me back to the front end. Now all these links in the middle are just practice assignments. You can do them if you want, you don't have to do them. I'm not gonna force anybody to do it, but if you have more time, if you have enough time, I would just click on these and just go through them, you know, because you pay for it. It's the learning resources, the more, you look at online and read, the better you're gonna be, by the way. So these are just practice links in the middle. So the major important link is always gonna be below where it says graded quiz. So in each exercise, they're all set up the same. Your chapter's at the top, learning links in the middle, and then a graded quiz. You have to do one of these graded quizzes each week because every week we're doing a new lab. So this week, technically, you're supposed to come in here, you can read your chapter, go through the learning links, whatnot, and then you can do your quiz. All right, so this is where one of your assignments is located in this Engage website. So I wanted to specifically go over that because some students are confused about that. The rest of our assignments is actually gonna be in our Canvas site. So the only assignment that you're responsible for in the Engage site is always just this one quiz that's under graded quizzes. So if I click on, you know, exercise Sorry, two. I have a question about the quiz. Is it timed? They're not timed and you have three attempts to do it. So um, you should be able to uh, get a hundred on them because you can review them, whatnot. Uh, these are all open book assignments. All of your homework quizzes and whatnot are all open book. So here's exercise two, quiz, scroll down, exercise three, so forth and so on, all right? 
All right. Um, so does anybody have any questions about the Engage website? All right, very good. If you do and you don't want to say anything yet, just email me later, it's fine. Um, so just remember, you can always come in here and get your chapter that you're covering for that week. So this week we're doing introduction to the body. Next week we're doing the epithelial tissues we're gonna get into, so forth and so on, all right? Let me go back to our Canvas site. I'm gonna show you where the rest of your homework assignments are. All right, so that's the Engage site. So once you do that, you're gonna be clicking in there and accessing the ebook and your assignments and Engage every week. So in the exercise modules, they're all set up pretty much the same. Some of this stuff you won't see because I don't have it published, but the stuff that is published in there is obviously the stuff that you're responsible for, for looking at. So ultimately you're gonna have some pre-lab assignments and work. These pre-lab assignments um, and the post lab assignments and the engage quizzes. So pre lab assignments, post lab assignments, and the engage quizzes all count as 35% of your grade. And all of those assignments are open book. You can use whatever resource you want. These pre lab assignments that's at the beginning of each one of the learning modules like exercise one and next one's exercise two, so forth and so on. All of these pre-lab assignments, you have unlimited attempts to do them. Um, and everybody, as long as you are attempting to do these assignments, everybody's gonna get a 10 out of 10 on those assignments because these are more of a participation grade but most, mostly people get them all right anyway. If you, keep, if you get them wrong the first time, just go back in and do it again. You can do them as many times as you want. Down at the bottom, your post-lab assignments, everybody gets really good grades on these as well. You have three attempts to do the post-lab assignments. And I have all of these assignments set up to where you can actually review them and you can start seeing the right answer. The pre-lab assignments and the post-lab assignments are going to prepare you to take your practical and your and the physiology test. So we have we have four testing blocks in AMP1 lab. So we're going to take a practical and a physiology test for each testing block. So we have four practicals and we have four physiology tests. The practicals and the physiology test along with your final practical at the end of the semester, all count as 65% of your grade. So that's where the rest of your grade comes from. All right, so let me show you. You can't see this assignment section. It's just for me. Oh, I can't show you because this is over here. I don't know. But this first column is where I put all of the pre-lab assignments and I'm probably going to throw the engage quizzes in here. I have to do that manually. And then I got another module for the post lab assignments. These two modules, all assignments that go into these two modules count for a total of 35% of your grade. And all of those assignments are open book. Now, if I scroll down, I then have a testing module in the grade book. This is where your practicals are going to be the physiology test, which I don't have in here yet, and your final exam, your final practical. All of the tests that we, cut, that we take, your practicals, the physiology test, and the final are the only assignments in the class that are not open book. And all of these tests count as 65% of your grade. So 65% of your grade comes from our, our major test, and 35% of your grade comes from all your homework. All of these pre and post lab assignments is basically all of your homework. So every week you should be completing the assignments for that exercise that we're covering that week. All right. You never wait until the due date to do the assignments. The due dates are always well past when the assignment should already be done. So for instance, Technically, the pre-lab assignments should be completed 
before we have lab for that week. But obviously we're going through add drop. So some students aren't even in the class yet. They might add today and miss class. So their first, their first class is gonna be next week. So ultimately I left these open until August 26th. But again, they're supposed to be done today. So all of the exercises, pre-lab and post-lab work, and your Engage quiz that you have to go to the Engage website to complete should be completed the week that we're covering the lab. Is that, is that clear for everybody? Yes. Please do not wait until the due dates to do the assignments. That is, the due dates are only there because I have to put a due date and that's just the, the last day the assignment's gonna be available. It doesn't mean do it on that day. And if you're in my lecture, it's the same thing with my lecture. Everybody wants to know, oh, when is it due? When is it due? Well, it, you should have done it last week. We're on a different chapter this week. So just keep up with your work and you'll be fine. All right. Now, in the middle of the, the exercise modules is where the learning resources are. Um, some modules have some lectures in them. Some have some other videos all of the teachers got together and started compiling different types of information to make the lab go virtual. And we did that at the end of the spring. So you might see a lecture from Dr. Blaylock, from Dr. Rosenzweig. Uh, you might see some quizlets that uh, I put together, whatever the case may be. So we're gonna have learning resources down here in, in the lab material. Um, I wrote a lab manual a long time ago that I used to use on the West Bank campus. We don't use it anymore. I'm gonna put those links in the learning modules as well. So um, I'm gonna click on this in a minute. It's just a little bit of extra stuff you can do. It's like a workbook. And uh, let me click on it now and just show you. So I made more of, of a workbook that we used to use and there's some definitions in here. I'm gonna go through some of this stuff in a minute with you. Uh, a little matching exercise, a picture to identify the parts of the body, you know, um, little write-in exercises, uh, how to identify that, you know, the uh, abdominal pelvic regions and the quadrants, stuff like that. So I made it more like a workbook and I forgot to put the appendix in here that has the right answers to it. So I'm gonna do that. Um, so you can work on the workbook if you want. It's, you know, it's nothing that I collect. It's not for points, it's just to help you learn. So I'm gonna post my chapters as well in the book that we used to use. Now these links in the middle, when you see a link and it has like, this means chapter one A, right? So all of these links are from a different lab manual that Wiley uses. Um, and it's a lab manual that contains the same pictures that are in your lecture book. So some people don't have lecture and they might not have a lecture book. I'm, gonna, I'm about to lecture out of the lecture book in a second, because basically what we're doing today is the last half of chapter one in your textbook from lecture. So some people don't have that. So what Wiley did over the end of the spring is they let students have free access to this lab manual. So I left all of these links posted so you can review them if you want to. It's just more learning resources. So you, you, if you uh, click on this, it'll bring you to the section in that lab manual that has the pictures in it. So it's just more learning resources. So just to let you know, the way we set up these modules is to allow students to technically go through the course by themselves in on online learning system. So if you go down all of these links and then study back and forth and do this and study down here and do that and study in here and then do your post lab work, you technically can complete this course on your own. And in fact, the online students are doing that. So that's why I wanna record all of our stuff so they can see what's going on as well, give them a little bit of extra learning resources. So you're gonna be doing a whole module like this every week, all right? So all your learning resources are gonna be in the middle. 
have some practice activities in here, but make sure you get your pre and your post lab assignments done. They are part of your grade. And it's, it should be an easy part of your grade. I don't wanna say easy because it is time consuming, but they are open book. And it counts as 35% of your grade, which should help out somewhat, all right? All right, so let me go back to the front end of this before I go where I need to go to start the actual uh, lab material today. Does anybody have any questions about how the course is going to be run? Assignments or anything? All right, I take the silence as everybody understands. Very good. And again, if you have a question, just uh, you know, email me later. I got another class after hours, but I'll email you back later on this afternoon. All right. So, and everybody can still hear me, correct? Oh yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Because my internet said unstable a while ago. I guess it's back working. All right, great. So today, what I want to do is go over the introductory material to the body. Let me see where I put that. Oh, it's right here. All right. So what I did before class is I opened up the ebook chapter for chapter one for the lecture book. So basically what you're looking at right now is the lecture book. All right. Um, and you know, we're a little ways into it. It's the second half of the book. All right. Well, right after the first half of the book, I forgot I need to tell you a little bit about this though. All right. So let me just get started and let you know where you, you're going to have to be studying. All right. There are 11 different body systems in our body. You need to know the name of the 11 body systems and you just, you need to know the basic functions of the body system. So just the name of the system and just a little bit about what the system does. We're not, I'm not making you learn every single thing about each system right now, because that's what lectures for and labs for as we go through the different systems. But for instance, the skeletal system is involved in supporting everything in your body, protecting everything in your body. It also allows for your muscles to attach, uh, muscle attachment allows for movement. If your muscles weren't attached to your bones, then you wouldn't have any movement. Um, all of your blood cells come from a tissue that's inside of your bone. So these are a lot of things that we're going to look at as we go through the semester, but just make sure you know the name of the 11 body systems and their basic functions. Just this one sentence right here under each one. And I'm going to talk about a couple of those systems in a minute. If anybody does not have um, the lecture book, just email me and I'll find a way of getting you that information. All right. I'm assuming everybody has a lecture book. All right. So where we need to start today is at something called homeostasis. Technically in your engaged lab manual, the lab manual for the course, chapter one starts with what is homeostasis. So we need to know what homeostasis is and how it's regulated in our body. So homeostasis basically is a state of well-being. And what that means is, is that basically all the different types of conditions in your body are within normal ranges and you're healthy. And I'll, we're going to go through blood, blood pressure in a second. Everybody knows blood pressure. So we have a whole bunch of conditions in our body, like blood pressure, that have specific ranges they have to be within in order for us to be considered healthy. For instance, if I say, okay, let's consider blood pressure as our condition. If your blood pressure is higher than normal, you have high blood pressure or hypertension. Everybody knows that. In which case, just by saying you have high blood pressure, do you think you're healthy? No. So, in order for us to be in what we call homeostasis or have all of our conditions within normal ranges and be considered healthy, we have to regulate all of those conditions if they go up or they go down because the conditions do go up and they do go down. 
I'm probably raising your blood pressure right now with this lecture. <laughs> but um, nonetheless, when our conditions in our body go up or down, our body has to know that the condition changes. Yep, the condition went up, we better bring it back down. Or the condition fell, it got lower, we better bring it back up to normal. So all of that involves what we call a homeostatic feedback loop or a feedback system. So to maintain all of the conditions within normal ranges, we have basically reflexes. Everybody knows that word, a reflex. Well, in AMP, we have to change the word reflex to homeostatic feedback system. You know, just because the anatomists want to have fancy words, I don't know. So the feedback systems are the reflexes in our body that will adjust a condition and maintain it within a normal range. So the normal ranges for a condition have an upper limit and they have a lower limit. And those limits are called physiological limits. So your normal blood pressure range, you know, if you're above, if you're, if you're, Top number is above 130. You're in pre-hypertension. If your bottom number of your blood pressure, which we, we're going to do in AMP2, but if your bottom number is above 93, you're in hypertension one. So the ranges of the condition have upper and lower limits, and those limits are called physiological limits. And the goal of all of the feedback systems is to regulate the controlled condition within those limit ranges. So we have to maintain our conditions within physiological limits. So ultimately a feedback loop consists of these components. There's always a controlled condition. That's whatever the body's regulating is the condition like blood pressure there are always receptors which monitor the condition. And I'm going to teach you a, a receptor in a second, a type that controls blood pressure, regulates, uh, monitors blood pressure. So the condition is always monitored by a receptor. The receptors are always sending information about the condition to a control center. The control center is more often than not your brain. So we have a bunch of different centers in the brain that regulate vital organ body systems. Like uh, there's a cardiovascular system that regulates cardiac activity and blood pressure and all of that. There's a respiratory center that regulates your respiratory uh, rate and whatnot. We're gonna get into all of that physiology in AMP2. So the control center is constantly receiving information about the condition from a receptor. Now, the control center might be receiving information that says, hey, the condition went up. Or the control center might be receiving information about the condition that says the condition went down. And what does the control center do? It depends on if the condition is going up or down. The control center then has what we call output information. The input and the output information, input from the receptors and output from the control center is always nervous impulses from the nervous system, electrical impulses from basically nerves and or chemical messengers like hormones in the body, all right? So the control center will send out an output information to a worker in the body, which is called an effector. Any tissue or organ in the body that can bring about some type of physiological change is called an effector. All right, so effectors then will either increase what they do or decrease what they do, ultimately to change the controlled condition. I know I'm speaking generically right now. I'm going to go through a real example in a second. So um, the control center sends output information that basically tells the effectors in the body to either increase their metabolism or decrease their metabol uh, metabolism, which changes the condition 
and we call that the response. So the response of a feedback loop will either be to increase or to decrease the condition. It just depends on what's going on with it, all right? Now, a stress in our body, everybody knows the word stress. Stressors come in all forms. There's physical stress where you might fall and hurt yourself. Physical damage, that's a stressor. There's emotional stress. Um, there's, and we have what's called physiological stress, chemical stressors in our body. Um, a stressor is anything that changes a condition. And in our book, the stressors are just called the stimulus. So a stimulus is any con anything that changes the controlled condition. So this is a generic feedback loop, all of the components of a feedback loop. So you have to know the feedback loop has a controlled condition, which is monitored by receptors. The receptors send input information about the condition to the control center. The control center sends out output information to a worker in the body called an effector that can ultimately bring a change in the condition, which is called the response. So this would be the response of a reflex. This technically is a reflex that we're looking at. So let me go through, I wonder if I can decrease the size of my page a little bit. All right, good. Now I can fit it all on the page. All right, so here's a feedback loop. Very simple, generic one to show how we regulate blood pressure, all right? So blood pressure in this particular loop, which is called a negative feedback loop, I'll describe in a second is blood pressure. So some stress or stimulus is disrupting your state of well-being, disrupting homeostasis by increasing blood pressure, like this lecture. <laughs> so the stimulus, whatever the stimulus is, it's increasing our controlled condition. And if the controlled condition goes higher than the, the, the top physiological limit, then you're not healthy and we have to generate a feedback loop to bring it back to normal. So here's how the loop works. The condition is being, that has to be controlled is called the controlled condition, in this case, blood pressure. The stimulus is increasing pressure. There are special receptors in our major blood vessels that monitor your blood pressure. Yes, it's kind of cool. We have receptors in the wall of our major blood vessels that like in your carotid arteries, everybody's probably heard of those that go up your neck and in the largest artery in the body, the aorta. So these receptors that monitor blood pressure are specifically called baroreceptors because the prefix baro means pressure. So the receptors that monitor blood pressure are just called baroreceptors. So these baroreceptors constantly are, are sending input information, nerve impulses to the brain, the control center. It's telling the control center in the brain what is going on with your blood pressure. So these baroreceptors are now sending nerve impulses to the brain, telling the brain, hey, blood pressure is going up. The brain being the control center has the job of asking this question. Yep, blood pressure went up, but how high did it go? Because even though it goes up, it doesn't mean that it went outside of the top limit. What if it's still within the normal range? Yep, it went up, but it's still below the upper limit. That means you're still somewhat normal. So the control center has the job of analyzing all of the input data and, and, and determining if an output information to a worker is, respond, is, is needed to maintain homeostasis or to bring the condition back within its normal ranges. So for this lecture, let's say that whatever the stress or stimulus is that's increasing blood pressure makes the blood pressure go higher than the upper limit. The baroreceptors send the input nerve impulse to the control center in the brain. The brain says, yep, blood pressure is too high. We better do something about it. So the brain sends out nerve impulses, which is the output information, to the effectors that are responsible for regulating blood pressure. And lo and behold, your heart is responsible in part, a big part, 
in controlling your blood pressure. So if our blood pressure is too high, the brain is going to have output information to the heart that's going to slow your heart rate down. It's also going to decrease how forceful your heart contracts. So by decreasing heart rate and decreasing how forceful your heart contracts, which is called contractility, it decreases your blood pressure. Because if your heart is pumping more blood out into the system faster and harder, your blood pressure is higher. So if you want to decrease your blood pressure, you want to decrease cardiac activity. So the brain sends out inhibitory signals to the heart. The heart slows down and your blood pressure comes down. Now, the other effector that can regulate your blood pressure are little arteries in your body, the blood vessels in your body. And the way that they can help regulate pressure is by changing their diameter. Now, we haven't talked about this yet because we just started, but some of y'all might know these terms already vasodilation and vasoconstriction. When a blood vessel increases its diameter, that's called vasodilation. When a blood vessel decreases its diameter and gets smaller, that's called vasoconstriction. And as it turns out, if we vasodilate or increase the diameter of these little arteries, which are called arterioles, it decreases your blood pressure. On the other hand, if these little blood vessels decrease their diameter, which is called vasoconstriction, that would increase your blood pressure. So in this case, since our blood pressure is too high already, we have inhibitory signals that are going to the heart. It slows your heart down. We have signals that go to the blood vessels that tell the blood vessel to relax the smooth muscle around it and we get vasodilation, they get bigger that also helps decrease your blood pressure. So the response of the loop is a decrease in heart rate and vasodilation of our blood vessels, which de uh, decreases our blood pressure back to normal. <coughs> Excuse me. So this loop or reflex is gonna run and run and run until your blood pressure comes back down to normal. And then when your blood pressure comes back down to normal, the loop automatically shuts off. So let me tell you what a negative feedback loop is. This is an example of a negative homeostatic feedback loop. And what we know when there is a, a negative loop because the response of the loop is exactly opposite to the original stimulus to begin with. So the original stimulus increased the condition. The response of the loop decreases the condition. So the stimulus is increased in the condition and we run the loop and the response decreases the condition back to normal. That would be considered a negative feedback loop. The other thing is this, the majority of all the, the feedback loops that you're gonna learn for a whole year of AMP are gonna be negative feedback loops. In fact, over the course of one whole year of AMP, we're only gonna learn two positive feedback loops. We're about to learn the first one in a second, and you're gonna learn your second one when we get to AMP2, which involves blood clotting. But nonetheless, ultimately negative feedback loops turn on on their own, and they turn off on their own. Just like the thermostat in your house that regulates your air conditioner, I don't know if you read chapter one yet, but I think in there they have an analogy of your air conditioning unit in your house. I mean, when your house gets hot, you don't have to go turn your AC on if you have it set. If you have the thermostat set, when the temperature gets too hot, the thermostat kicks your AC on, right? Everybody knows that. And then when the house cools off enough, the thermostat kicks the AC off. So it comes on and off on its own because it's a negative loop. You set the parameters which is in that case, the temperature of your house. But we also have all of those parameters preset in our body. We have these physiological limits. The receptors always monitor the condition and always sends input information to the, to the control center that tells the control center if the condition is normal or not. 
And if the control center is outside the normal range, then a loop is turned on to bring it back within a normal range. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so does anybody have any questions about a negative feedback loop? All right, this is gonna help you out with lecture as well because we do this in chapter one in lecture. So th the negative feedback loop example is blood pressure. But we also have positive feedback loops. I should say this as well, the word negative does not mean bad and the word positive doesn't necessarily mean good, although everything's good when we regulate physiology. Um, <clears throat> it just means how the loop is being controlled. So positive feedback loops, the first one you're learning deals with the, the birth of a baby, all right? So let me set you up as to how this loop is gonna run. The controlled condition in this loop is the degree to which the cervix is stretching. So I'm assuming everybody knows what the cervix is. It's the most anterior portion of the uterus, just at the uh, distal end of the uterus at, at the junction of the vaginal canal. This is where the baby is gonna have to go through in order to go through the birth canal to be born. So there is a con there's a loop that controls the st how stretched this is. <coughs> Sorry, my throat's real dry, I'm talking too much. Um, so when the baby begins to go down into the cervix, the head of the baby pushes on the cervix and stretches it. So there are special receptors that monitor how stretched the cervix is. Those are called stretch sensitive receptors. They send the input information about the degree to which the cervix is being stretched to the brain. The brain says, yep, the cervix is being stretched. We better do something about it. So in this case, the output information is not a nerve output. Nerves are not going to go to the uterus and make the uterus contract, but rather a hormone will. So the input information is a nerve impulse from the receptor, but the output information that goes to the uterus, specifically the smooth muscle in the middle of the uterus called the myometrium, that smooth muscle is going to contract due to this hormone called oxytocin. So the brain says, yep, the cervix is stretched. We better do something about it. it a gland hanging off the brain releases oxytocin. Oxytocin gets in the blood, circulates down to the uterus and causes the uterine contraction. So that's the contractions that the female has when she's trying to deliver the baby. But what happens when the uterus contracts? Well, it pushes the baby down through the cervix and starts to go into the birth canal. So it stretches the cervix even more. So the response of this loop is the cervix becomes more stretched. So look at the response of this loop. The response of this loop actually increases the original stressor. So the original stress was increasing the condition, which is a stretch of the cervix. The response of the loop increases it even more. <clears throat> so ultimately in a positive feedback loop, the controlled condition actually keeps changing until something outside of the loop happens that brings the condition back to normal. So that's a major difference with a positive loop and a negative loop. All right, so the response of a positive loop basically augments the original stress of the condition. So this loop is gonna run again. So since the cervix stretched again, the receptor fires to the brain saying, hey, the cervix is stretched again. The brain says, yep, the cervix is stretched. So what does it do? Releases oxytocin. Oxytocin gets in the blood, circulates to the uterus, specifically the myometrium, the smooth muscle in the wall of the uterus, makes it contract, pushes the baby even more down through the cervix, which stretches the cervix even more. Receptor fires to the brain saying the cervix is stretched again. Brain releases oxytocin, causes uterine contraction, pushes the baby down in there even more, stretches the cervix even more. So this loop is actually going to run and run and run and run and run 
until something outside of the loop happens that will turn the loop off. In this case, it's the birth of the baby. So look in here in the loop. Nothing in this loop talks about the baby being born. But the loop itself is going to cause the baby to be delivered. Obviously, we know that. So as the baby is being delivered and is born, the cervix is going to stop being stretched. It's going to go back down to its original size a little bit. The placenta has to be delivered as well, but the baby and the placenta have to come out and the cervix stops being stretched and the receptors fire to the brain saying, hey, the cervix is not stretched anymore. So the brain stops releasing oxytocin and slowly but surely the loop will, will slow down and then ultimately turn off. Now, the reason why I said ultimately slow down and turn off is because the output information for this loop is a hormone. And any reflex or homeostatic feedback loop, which is controlled by hormones, the reflexes last a, a lot longer. So <clears throat> ultimately, since this is controlled by a hormone, a female is still going to get uterine contractions even after the baby is delivered and the placenta is delivered. Does anybody know why that also is important? Can anybody tell me? Why is it important that the, the uterus continues to contract even after the baby and the placenta is delivered? To control blood loss? Well, <clears throat> it's not necessarily to control the blood loss, but I understand what you're saying. It ultimately is to make the uterus get back down to its normal size. Look, and, and it may control blood loss to some degree because the muscle is going to contract and, and start to squeeze on all those vessels in there where the placenta was. But its main role is to contract and contract to get this uterus back down to its small size. I mean, look, the baby was in there, so it's a lot bigger than it normally is in a non-pregnant female. We all know that. So that's the importance of hormonal loops, endocrine loops. Endocrine loops last longer than loops that are regulated by the nervous system. And I guess I should have told you that at the beginning. There's two of the body systems in our body that regulate homeostasis, only two. The endocrine system with hormones, like oxytocin here, and the nervous system via nerve impulses. Those are the two systems in your body that regulate all of your physiology, blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, all of those things. All right. So that's a positive feedback loop <clears throat> is the, is the labor contractions for the birth of a baby. So if you have any questions on that later, just, just email me. All right. Now I spent a little bit more time on that um, than I should have, but I like to always go through homeostasis in, in some detail because it's going to help you out with a lecture as well as in lab. The main thing that you're going to be doing because I'm not going to read off all of these words. The main thing from lab this week <clears throat> is to go through a lot of terminology and learn a lot of terminology. So after lab today, you're going to be learning terminology and you're going to be working on your assignments. All right. And then emailing me if <clears throat> you have any questions. So you have a picture like this. I even have one in my book that has some names on it. And the goal, partly of lab this week, is to get you to learn the anatomical name for the part of a body. Like everybody knows that this region right here is your neck. That's a common name. Or I could say, oh, this is my head. Well, we need to know the anatomical language for the parts of the body. Like everybody, oh, this is your upper arm. Well, it's also called the brachium, right? Your lower arm, or, or, or people say, oh, my forearm. That's called your anti-brachium. So what you're learning to do your lab practicals and your physiology tests are these scientific anatomical terms for the part of the body. For instance, the, palm, uh, the, the, 
the palm of your hand is called palmer. That one was pretty easy. Your fingers are called digit or phalangeal because your fingers contain little bones in them as we're gonna learn in the bone chapter, skeletal chapter, which are called phalanges. So we call this a digital region or your phalangeal region, which is just your fingers. So if there's a pointer pointing right here on the test, I don't want finger. I know you know this is your finger. I want you to tell me it's a, it's digit, a digit or a phalangeal region. Same thing with your thigh. Everybody knows it's your thigh, but the anatomical term for that is femoral. So I'm not going to go and read down every one of these words. This is your part of your homework. You have to learn the names of the parts of the body, the anatomical names. All right. Like what is the, the name of your calf? Everybody knows that's your calf. Well, that's called cyril. What about the front of your lower leg? That's called crural. Right. So those are the names that you're learning. Does anybody have any questions about that? <laughs> no. All right. Very good. Um, we also have to go through directional terms. So you have to know them by definition and you have to be able to describe, like use it in a sentence. And there's some, you know, there's a couple of activities in the lab module that allow you to do this. All right, even in your lab book, go to exercise one in your engage manual and just go to the, a couple of the last pages in there and you see some, uh, it's like a, a fill in the blank section. So, and I'm gonna I'm tell you what these terms are. We have to know these directional terms because in anatomy, we have to use these terms to describe where certain structures are in relation to other structures, right? <clears throat> so let's go over the directional terms. You, you can read through their definitions up here and then learn how it's used in, in an, an example uh, sentence, right? So let, let, look at the first one, superior. And some of y'all might know these terms already. When we use the word superior to describe any structure that is closer towards the head of your body, up towards your head. So any structure that is closer towards the head or the upper part of a structure, we would always call it superior to anything that is lower. So for instance, look in the sentence. It says the heart is superior to the liver. I'm sure everybody knows where the liver is a little bit. Well, if you look at this picture, the liver's down here. Well, the heart's up here in your, in your thoracic cavity. So the heart, which is behind your sternum, your breastbone right here, is higher up than the liver. It's closer towards the head than the liver is. So I would say the heart is superior to the liver. But look at the other word we have, inferior. Inferior would be used to describe any structure that's farther away from the head or any structure that is lower down the body than another structure. So look at this statement. The stomach is inferior to the lungs. Well, look where it's at. The lungs are up here in the thoracic cavity. Your stomach and your liver, for that matter, are in the abdominal cavity. So your stomach is lower or farther away from the head than the lungs. So we would say that the lungs are superior to the stomach, or I would say the stomach is inferior to the lungs. Okay. Now, on the practical, they have this little muscle man looking model. And they draw arrows on it, similar to this, all right? And they put little numbers on the, you know, the guy, like they might have a number right here with an arrow going up and down. What would we call that? Well, we call that the midline. The very middle of the body is called the midline, all right? <clears throat> now, anything that is farther away from the midline to either side of the body, is always called lateral. So lateral means to the side of the body and midline is just the medial part of the body. So anything closer to midline, we would say it's medial to relative to something else that is farther away from midline to the side of the body, we would call it lateral, All right? Um, let me see if, they, yeah, they do have those words. So let me show you these words real quick that kind of confuse students. 
All right, so there are two types of terms used to describe when something's lateral. There's something called ipsilateral. The, the prefix ipsy means the same. So when we are comparing two structures that are lateral, meaning they, they are on the side of the body, if they're on the same side of the body, we would say they are ipsilateral, right? Now, <clears throat> um, contralateral means that we're still talking about structures that are to the side of the body. But if the, if the structures we are comparing are on opposite sides of the body, it's called contralateral. Contra means against or opposite here. So let me show you in, the, in this picture. I can say that the gallbladder and the stomach are contralateral. The stomach is just off midline to the left of the body. The gallbladder, which is just below the right lobe of the liver, is off to the right side of, of the midline of the body. So the gallbladder and the stomach are contralateral. However, I can say that the ascending colon, which this is right here, called the ascending colon of your large intestine, is ipsilateral to your appendix. Here's the appendix, comes off the cecum of the ascending colon right there. So since the uh, appendix and the ascending colon are, are lateral, they're not directly on midline, uh, and they're on the same side of the body, I can say they are ipsilateral. I can say that the ascending colon and the gallbladder are ipsilateral. However, I could also say that the ascending colon is contralateral to the descending colon. So you have different parts of your colon, a part that goes up called ascending, a part that comes over across, crosses over midline, that's called the transverse colon. And then it goes down, that's called descending. There's another part that goes backwards. We're gonna learn all of that in AMP2, but nonetheless, you get the point. So I, I use this picture because you can see where some of the organs are located, right? So let's look at uh, some of these other terms like proximal and distal. Now, we have to use proximal and distal when we are describing the location of structures with other structures as far as the appendages are concerned. And when I say something, the appendages are your arms and legs. If I say something is proximal, that means that that structure is closer to the point of attachment of the appendage to the trunk of the body. For instance, I can say your upper arm bone, which is your brachial bone, it's called the humerus, is proximal to the phalangeal bones in the digits. The phalangeal bones in your fingers or the digits are farther away from the point of attachment. So I would say that the phalangeal bones are distal to the humerus. So anything that is closer to the point of attachment, we would call it proximal. Anything farther from the point of attachment, we would call it distal. Now we use these directional terms to compare structures in the body. So I can't, I, I, I can't say, I can't just say uh, the carpal bones, which are your wrist bones, are distal. I, I can't say that. I have to compare it to something else. Now I can say the carpal bones, which is eight little bones that make up your wrist bones. The carpal bones are distal to the radius and the ulna. They're also distal to the humerus. However, I can't always just call them distal because look, I then can say the carpal bones are proximal to the metacarpals, which are the bones of the palm of your hand, because the metacarpals are farther away from the point of attachment than the carpal bones, even though they're right next to each other. They're still farther away. So the carpals are proximal 
to the metacarpals. The carpals are proximal to the phalanges. The metacarpals are distal to the ulna. The metacarpals are distal to the radius. Does everybody understand me when I, the way I'm using these terms? Yep. <clears throat> All right, very good. Now, so, and you have to know the terms in this list. So I probably skipped over some as I go through this picture. So let me just show you real quick. So superior means closer to the head. Inferior means farther away from the head. Anterior means the front of your body. So anything that's closer to the front of the body, I can say it's anterior. So for instance, let me use that one. Everybody knows your heart's right here, right behind your sternum, right? Which is your breastbone. I can say that the sternum is anterior to the heart because it's closer to the front of the body. Or I could say the heart is posterior to the sternum. Now there's a couple other terms I can use as well. There are, if they're in here, let me see. Oh yeah, superficial and deep. The term superficial means closer to the surface of the body, like on your skin, closer to the skin. And the term deep means farther away from the surface of the body, which means internal, deeper in your body. It's, it's just deep. So I can say that the sternum is superficial to the heart. I could say the heart is deep to the sternum. So there are sometimes you can use those terms interchangeably. So posterior always means uh, near, closer to the posterior, closer to the back of the body. Anything closer to your back would be called posterior. Anything closer to the front or belly of your body is called anterior, all right? So we have to learn those terms. If you have a problem with them, just let me know and I'll, I'll answer you back in your email. The other thing that we have to know are what planes are, planes and sections. Because in A&P and in other sciences you probably will take, you'll be looking at sections of organs, you'll be looking at sections of sli uh, slides of tissues which are sectioned. Um, and so you have to know what you're really looking at. What type of section do I have? So the planes of the body are these. All of the planes will section the body and or an organ into two halves. That's what a plane does. You send a plane through the body or through an organ, like the pictures I'll show you in a minute. You can put a plane through an organ like the brain. Planes will section the body or organ into two halves. So what two halves do you get from each type of plane? Well, let's start with the frontal plane. Here's a frontal plane right here, and look where it goes through the body this way. So here's your frontal plane. You can see the little section right here on the frontal plane. And so a frontal plane will give you anterior and posterior halves. That's what a frontal plane does. So basically you send a plane through the side of the body like that, you're gonna get a front and the back, basically. We call that anterior and posterior halves. Hopefully you can see that from the picture. Then we have a transverse plane. Look what a transverse plane does. A transverse plane goes straight through this way. So whenever the body or an organ is sectioned with a transverse plane, you always get a superior and an inferior half. So we have an upper part and a lower part, superior and inferior halves. That's what a transverse plane does. We then have something called a mid-sagittal plane. A mid first of all, a sagittal plane runs from anterior to posterior through the middle of the body. And if the plane, if the sagittal plane is directly down the midline of the body, you're going to get equal right and left halves. You're going to get an equal right half. You're going to get an equal left half in a mid-sagittal plane because you're cutting the body directly down the middle. That's a mid-sagittal plane. But we also have a sagittal plane that goes down the middle of the body 
but it's just off center from the midline. So if you have a sagittal plane that is just off center from midline, it's called a parasagittal plane. And from this point forward, we're gonna see the word para in other science names as we go through A and P. The word para means on the side of. So the sagittal plane that's on the side of the midline is called a parasagittal plane. So parasagittal planes could either be off center just to the right or off center just to the left. And in which case you get unequal, unequal right and left halves. Mid sagittal plane, you're gonna get an equal right and left half. Parasagittal planes, you get an unequal right and left half, right? So the last type of plane is called an oblique plane. Oblique planes are planes that run at an angle, about a 45 degree, it doesn't have to be exactly 45, but at any plane at an angle. So if we section the body or an organ at an angle and then look at it, that would be called an oblique plane. So that's an angular plane. So here is some of those sections that go through the brain because we can section organs in the body as well. So in fact, when we get to the nervous system, we're gonna look at some of these sections. We're gonna identify the cerebrum, the cerebellum, the midbrain, the wow. pons, the medulla oblongata, all this stuff. We're gonna identify all this stuff from a mid sagittal plane section. So if we take the brain and cut it in half right down the middle of the brain, which would be the midline of the brain, then you get an equal right and left half. So what we see in this real picture of the human brain, this is the left side of the brain. So we cut it in half, we remove the right half, and what we're looking at is the middle portion of the left half of the brain. This was cut right down the middle. So this is a mid sagittal plane. Look at a frontal plane. You're gonna get anterior and posterior halves. Go ahead. Can y'all still hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, very good. I thought I heard somebody ask a question. Did anybody have a question? All right. I know you're tired. We're almost done. Hold on a little bit longer. Um, your brains are tired of looking at this computer, I'm sure. Um, so a frontal plane is gonna give us anterior halves and posterior half. So we look at that with through the brain on the real brain, basically we cut it down with a frontal plane and we remove the front half off. And now you're looking at what the brain looks like with a frontal section. And so you can see inside of our brain, and this is our, I keep saying brain, but this is a cerebrum there are holes in our brain that's filled up with fluid. I'm gonna teach you that later on. All right, so that's a frontal section. Then a transverse plane, you get superior and inferior halves. So right here, you're looking down on the brain with a transverse section. So we're looking down as a superior section right here. And in the middle of the cerebrum, which are those two little holes right there, you can see what it looks like from the top. Those are called the lateral ventricles right there. They're filled with fluid in our brain. All right, so those are the planes of the body. They, they might have you know, a piece of tape on a model saying what plane runs this way, what plane runs this way on the practical, all right? I don't know if they're gonna use this picture directly, but you can learn, you, obviously you can see what sections you get. So if they have on a model, a piece of tape that runs across you know, like this, and they say, what plane would that be called? Obviously, you're going to call up that plane a transverse plane, right? Something like that. All right. Now, the last couple of things we have to do, you have to know um, the body cavities. So the body cavities are the open spaces where your organs are located in your body. Obviously, I think you know that. So we have two primary body cavities. You have a dorsal body cavity, which is all in yellow. And you have a ventral body cavity, which is in blue and green. So those are the main names of the rest of the cavities that we have to identify. So dorsal, 
by the way, I didn't tell you that word. Dorsal means more towards the back, almost like posterior. And ventral means more closer to the front of the body, towards your belly. That's what ventral is. So the dorsal body cavity only includes where your brain and spinal cord is located. So that those are your cranial cavity in the cranium where your brain's at and the vertebral canal where your spinal cord runs down your vertebral column right here. So these two cavities make up our dorsal body cavity. Now the ventral body cavity is separated into what we call the thoracic cavity. That's everything in blue and the abdominal pelvic cavity, which is everything in green. All of this would be called our ventral body cavity. So inside the thoracic cavity, everybody knows what's in there a little bit, right? Your lungs and your heart. So there are smaller little bitty cavities that your heart lies within and that your lungs lie within, all right? The area in fact, where your heart and some major blood vessels and nerves are located in your thoracic cavity, which would be right here, where your heart would be located, is in an anatomical region called the mediastinum. It's the very central portion of the, of the thoracic cavity, which lies between the lungs and goes from your sternum all the way to your backbone, to the vertebral column. So your sternum's up here, it's more anterior and your vertebral column back here. So in between the lungs, only between the lungs, going from your sternum to the vertebral column, that's where your heart's located, is called the mediastinum. So the little cavity around your heart is called the pericardial cavity. The little cavity that your lungs lie within, we're gonna talk more about in AMP2, is called the pleural cavity. So these are just the areas where the lungs are, the pericardial cavities where the uh, heart's located, and the mediastinum is a central location between the lungs in the thoracic cavity from your sternum to the vertebral column. And obviously your heart's located in there. Now the abdominal pelvic cavity includes a portion of the cavity which we just call the abdominal cavity and a portion which is at the floor of the abdominal pelvic cavity. It's called the pelvic cavity. So you need to know what types of organs are located in these cavities. So if you look right here, the abdominal cavity, which extends from just below the diaphragm. Now, I'm sure everybody's heard of the diaphragm. The diaphragm is one of our, our principal inspiratory muscles. It is a delineation between the thoracic cavity and the lower abdominal pelvic cavity. So just below the diaphragm is called the abdominal cavity. And then at the level of the, I don't wanna tell you the word yet, but at the, at the very uh, top of our hip region, we have a little thing up here we're gonna learn later called the iliac crest. At, at the inguinal or iliac region, the iliac region up here, just below there is the floor of the abdominal pelvic cavity, and that's where your urinary bladder is located. Uh, portions of the, the large intestine, um, certain or organs of the reproductive system, like the female reproductive system, the uterus is there, the ovaries are there. Uh, you have special little tubes that run through there, right? That's all in the pelvic cavity. In the abdominal cavity is where the organs that you're probably familiar with, like your stomach and your liver, uh, parts of the small intestine, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the large intestine is in there, the pancreas, all of that stuff is in there in your abdominal cavity. So not only do you have to know how to identify them, but you, you need to know uh, the few little things that is here in the statement that shows you what's in that portion of the cavity. All right. Um, this is just a graphic showing the little cavities. I, you don't really need to review that. The last thing that we need, we need to learn are these. We need to learn a little bit about which organs are in this abdominal pelvic region. So for instance, your liver's up here, the majority of it's towards the right side of the body. A little bit of it crosses over to the left side of the body across midline. 
Um, the gallbladder is just underneath the right lobe of the liver. This is the right lobe of the liver. Your stomach lies more towards the left side of your body over here. Your large intestine has what I called earlier the ascending colon that goes up the, the right side of your body. The transverse colon goes across your, your abdominal pelvic cavity here. Uh, the descending colon goes down the left side of your body. In the pelvic cavity, you have your urinary bladder. That's the main thing in there that we're, we're talking about right now. But in females, the uterus would also be there with the ovaries and whatnot. So the reason why I say that is because a couple of the activities in the lab is going to ask you, what name an organ that is in this particular region of the abdominal pelvic cavity? So we have to learn the names of regions of the abdominal pelvic cavity and the names of what we call the abdominal quadrants, abdominal pelvic quadrants. So let's go over the regions first. <clears throat> and the reason why you're learning these names is because a lot of you are going to be going into some sort of a medical field. And on medical reports, um, when, when a doctor runs a scan, they're not going to say, um, I found a mass uh, it, it's, it's by their, uh, on their right side by their thigh. They don't do that. They use anatomical regional names to describe scientifically where they find, say, a mass, a tumor, or where there's a laceration or whatever the case may be. You know, they won't say, uh, you know, I found a, a, a laceration by the belly button. Uh, you know what I mean? Now, they will tell the patient that. They, they don't speak this way to the patient, but in their reports, they use scientific anatomical language. So let's go through these regions. So the regions can be split up into nine sections with what looks like a tic-tac-toe board. So I could tell you now on the practical, because they always do it. They take one of the little muscle men model and they put tape on it like this, and they, they might put a number in here. They'll say, identify number two, the region number two. Oh, that's the hypogastric region. So you're gonna have to be able to identify these things. They might also ask you to name an organ in that region. So if, for instance, if it was the hypogastric region, what's in this region of the abdominal pelvic cavity? Oh, the urinary bladder is. How do I know that? Because here's just some of the major organs up here that are part of this. They don't name all of them, but I'm sure you can write something like that in. So let me tell you the names of these and how we identify what the names are. First of all, let's start on the right side of the body. The region just below the ribs is called hypochondriac. So chondra means cartilage, cartilaginous. So the extensions off the lower ribs, as we'll see later, are these hyaline cartilaginous strips that ultimately go to the sternum, except for the last two pair of ribs that don't have cartilage coming off of them. But this, the region that's right below the ribs are called hypochondriac. So if it's on the right side of the body, it's the right hypochondriac region. If it's below the ribs on the left side, it's called the left hypochondriac region. Now the, the part in the middle that is the upper part of the abdominal cavity is called epigastric. All right, so in the very middle of your abdominal region is called umbilical. And y'all should know that because that's where the belly button is that I just mentioned. And it comes from where the umbilical cord attaches to us when we're babies in the uterus as we're growing, right? So the very middle is called umbilical. Above the umbilical region is called epigastric. Epi means above. Below the umbilical region is called hypogastric. Hypo means below. So what is in the, the right hypochondriac region? Well, we have a part of our liver. The right lobe of the liver is there for sure. What's in the epigastric region? Well, a part of the, the transverse colon a part of the stomach and a part of the liver. All of the left lobe of the liver is in it. What's in the left hypochondriac region? 
Well, the very left of the liver and some things that I didn't mention yet, but your spleen is right here, right? On the left side of your liver. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, on the left side of your stomach, I said liver. Your spleen's over there. A portion of the colon is right there, right? So you could just look at this picture and know a little bit about what you're looking at, what's in those regions. Now, what about on the side of the umbilical region, on the right and the left? Well, those, the sides right here are called lumbar because this region in your vertebral column is called the lumbar region. If I go back up to this picture, you can kind of see that even though we don't know it yet. Here's your vertebral column right here. The vertebral column is separated into a cervical region, a thoracic region, which includes all of the vertebrae that have little rib, rib attachments to them. So we have cervical, thoracic, right below thoracic, right here in this region is lumbar. That's your lumbar region. Right below that, the last part of the vertebral column is called the sacral region right there. So this region in the abdominal pelvic regions is called the lumbar region. The one on the right is right, the one on the left is left. Now, below the umbilical region is the hypogastric region. On either side of that, we have right and left. Those are called inguinal, the inguinal areas. Some books have iliac in it. So I think in our book, in our lab manual, we refer to it as inguinal. And I'm gonna grade the pra all the practicals by hand anyway. So if some people put iliac or they put inguinal, I'm, I'm gonna know what, what y'all are talking about. All right, so this is the right inguinal region, hypogastric and left inguinal region. Everybody kind of follow me, learn how to identify these things. I know I'm harping on that, but I wanna make sure you guys are getting it. Hold on, Dax. Sorry, that's my dog uh, needing to get up. So this is the last thing that I need to cover right here. And these are the quadrants, which is also not too terribly difficult. This is when you make a plus sign down the middle of the abdominal pelvic region. You have the right upper quadrant. You have the left upper quadrant. You have the right lower quadrant. And you have the left lower quadrant. If any of you have ever gone and got an MRI before or a CAT scan done somewhere, you might see these abbreviations in, not on the, you might even see them on the image if the, if the doctor let you see the image, but it'll definitely be in the radi radiologist report. I see constriction in the right upper quadrant, blah, 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 whatever they write in there. So the doctors use this terminology to describe where things are, not only in relation to other things, but their findings when people go get images done. All right, so that's where we're stopping. You're not going into this medical imaging down here or aging of and homeostasis. So you're gonna stop here at identifying all of these things. So before I stop sharing my screen, does anybody have any questions about what I covered in here? All right, if you do later, just email me. Um, and again, these images come from your lecture book. Some of these images are also in that lab manual. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen right now. Um, 